Carol was. She um, had gotten hepatitis C from her addiction issues. And also, she had a lifelong learning disability where she could not read to learn. She, um, she worked at a beauty parlor. She was a cosmetologist. And so when she had to uh, get a product out, the other girls in the shop read, would read the product and tell her what she had to do because she couldn't re read it to understand what she needed to do. And so along the way, Carol, I, I, I knew her for about 20, 25 years. And I would talk to her about the Lord and share Christ with her. And some of you know this story. But one night, we had a service here, and Carol came to visit. And someone prayed for her, and because she, you know, she came up for prayer for a sickness. She didn't say what the sickness was. She just came up for prayer for that. Now, she did not yet know the Lord. She didn't know the Lord yet. And when she came up to get prayer, the Spirit of God fell on her, and she fell down on the floor. She just fell down on the floor. She didn't even know what that was all about. But when she got up, she was different. She went back to the doctor, and that hepatitis C was gone. Now, fast forward it a little bit. Um, she became a Christian. She received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior couple years after that, you know, God touched her even before she was a Christian and healed her. But a, but a couple years later, her daughter came to Christ, received Jesus as her Savior, and she led her mother to the Lord. So um, Carol asked me, she called me one day, and she said, would you take me through my fourth and fifth step, my, my moral and spiritual um, I forget what you called it, but it was, it was steps in the 12-step program where she would go over her moral and, and uh, spiritual life, I guess. I, you know, there were things, and I went, yeah, I can do that. I can do that with you. And so she came over for a cup of tea, and she just began to talk, and she would tell me something that maybe was an issue in her spiritual or moral life or whatever that was, and we would deal with it right there she would I would lead her through a prayer and she would tell the Lord she was sorry and then I would command it to leave her and never come back it was just right over at the breakfast table you know with a cup of tea and she left she looked lighter she felt brighter and everything in her life well the next morning two mornings later two mornings later not the next day but two mornings later the phone rang early in the morning, and it was Carol, and she was screaming. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's wrong? Did something happen? And finally, she calmed down long enough, and she said, I can read for the first time in my life. She said, I can read, and I'm understanding what I'm reading. Now, God set her free during that spiritual and moral inventory with the 12-step program of a lifelong learning disability. And she was able to read and understand what she was reading for the first time. And she said, I didn't call you the next day because I was afraid it would go away. <laughs> she said, but when I woke up this morning, she said, I could read my Bible and understand what it meant. Now, Carol is home with the Lord now. She passed away several years ago. But um, I wanted to share that tonight because God can touch us. I didn't, even, I didn't even know she had that disability. You know what I'm saying? Like, she didn't bring that up that day. And God didn't need for me to know that. He knew what Carol's needs were. And as she began to present herself to him, in a way that we maybe wouldn't do that at a church. You know, we don't go through the 12-step program here. This is a church service. But when, we, when Carol did it that way, but cried out to him, 
as her higher power, guess what happened? He set her totally free. And from that moment on, she could read her Bible, read everything, and understand what it meant. So God is good. I've been pretty active tonight, haven't I? <laughs> hey, I'm let it rip. <laughs> hey, Jesus might come back tomorrow. I got some things to get done. <laughs> um, I almost forgot my wife said go up and tell him. Uh, we uh, called a special lots for prayer for my daughter, who uh, they put in the hospital early because she, uh, my youngest daughter, Jewel, because she's pregnant, and her blood pressure was going up. And the special ops prayed. And uh, yesterday she had a five pound, 14 ounce baby boy <laughs> in great health. Her life is, his name is Ethan Angel Dillard. So, yeah. So I forgot how many grandkids I got. I just know I got a few of them. <laughs> so. I, I, it's, it's, it's good. It was just up because of the pregnancy. And I was concerned because unfortunately her mother had the same issue. And uh, but special ops prayed, and guess what? She's fine. The baby's fine. And uh, and in fact, he was he was his weight birth weight is five fourteen, which is my birthday. Oh. That's a little present for me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I didn't plan on giving a testimony tonight, but as I got here, I got a testimony. Uh, I met. Patty, her name is Russo now, but it used to be Pulaski. And growing up, I was really good friends with her, one of her brothers. I was really good enemies with another one, but <laughs> Mike and I became really good friends. For about 20 months, we really hung out a lot. And the older brother, Skip, w w it was good we were together because he would like to fight with us, and the two of us could take him. <laughs> if, we got, if he got us alone, we were in trouble. Uh, but Mike and I would get on our bikes in Manahawk and then ride down Cedar Run Dock Road and we would fish in the creek there for snapper blues with little lures, you know, how you spin in lures. And we would fill a bucket up with, with uh, snapper blues. And I didn't really eat them, but he did something with them. I don't know. But as we got into high school, our ways kind of separated. I got heavily involved in sports and Mike was involved with other things. Uh, and we weren't as close any longer. And I knew that he had passed away in his 30s, I'd heard. And I was just talking with Patty. He, he, had, he battled with drugs. He had gotten saved, but he still battled with drugs. And I didn't know that he had gotten saved. And I was sitting here tonight, and I could see us fishing again. <laughs> and I just said, Lord, tell Mike to find a good spot. So when, I, when you call me home, we can take a day and go catch some snapper blues. I mean, isn't God good? To even, I mean, did you ever think about someone who passed away and you wondered if they made it? And see, tonight I don't have to wonder about Mike anymore. So let's give the Lord a hand cap. If anybody else has a testimony, go ahead. Bring up Sig. Sig, how long were you a pastor? 30 years? Whew. Got out of college in uh, 1980. When Moses was <laughs> crossing the Dead Sea. Yeah. <laughs> Burger King was just a prince. <laughs> Let's lay your hands on Father, I thank you for Sig right now. We've been praying for Sig because, Sig, I believe this is a shifting time in your life. You're not going to function the way you, you functioned since 1980. Mm. You're going to move into a spiritual realm that you've hungered for that you've never been before. You're going to bring forth revelation like you never did before. And, Father, we thank you for the shift in Sig's life in Jesus' name. Also, we lift up his son, Sam, who broke yeah. his wrist really bad snowboarding. What state was he in? Washington? Mount, uh, Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe. Just had operation on his wrist. Lord, we pray for supernatural healing in that wrist. 
in Jesus' name. Remove the pain, and Lord, bring the strength back as it was even greater in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He, uh, he had that surgery, and um, uh, I was supposed to fly out this week. He's in too much pain right now. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, so maybe next week I'm going to fly out there, and we're going to do a road trip all the way across country and uh, get to be with our, our youngest son and just um, looking forward to that. I hope, I hope it happens. Um, I'm going to do something tonight that I had never done in my entire ministry life. I'm going to teach on a book that I love incredibly. Um, you guys are start, trying to get it up there? Good, they're trying. Boy, we've had a lot of issues tonight back there. That, that laptop, there we go. Uh, that laptop, I don't know if it's on its last legs. I think um, Moses got that when we first got it. But um, I want to let you know, if you're watching by web, we've been having some uh, buffering issues. We don't know if, we don't think it's on this side here. Uh, it has to do with the internet. So if you're watching by web, uh, it, might, it might be fritzing out on you and so on. Uh, there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, anyway, uh, but I'm going to, I felt impressed to share this with you tonight. I think what I'm going to share with you can help propel you and I to the destiny that God has for each and every one of us. This morning, Robert Heidler was teaching on David. Yeah, it was, it was good. Preaching on David and about how David had to go through, through certain things to reach his destiny. And part of what I want to share with you tonight has to do with, I believe, some of the things that we have to overcome in our lives in order to get to the fulfillment of the destiny that God has for us. Uh, I'm going to do a teaching on the book of Proverbs, which I have never done in my entire life. I've referred to the book of Proverbs. Um, I've quoted Proverbs but have never actually done that. Hang on, I got a clicker here. And uh, let's see if this thing works. I think we should be good. Uh, but of all the 66 books in the Bible, um, Proverbs is probably the book that I have read the most in the course of my young life. I'm a little bit younger than Moses and not quite as old as Aaron and, and Ur there, but... And, uh, or <laughs> I didn't say that, Gordon. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, but this particular book, I've read a number of different times. When I was a freshman in college, I began to read the book of Proverbs. And that was in 1976, Trombones and the Big Parade. Um, and I have read it part of my uh, spiritual disciplines is to read certain particular books, and I share those with you on, on the Bible reading schedule. By the way, you can find that on our website, the Bible reading schedule. And one of the books that I've read every month has been the book of Proverbs. And I read the Psalms uh, since 1976. I've probably read the Psalms, I estimated, probably about 90 times through. Uh, I read it through twice a month. The Proverbs... Uh, I pretty much read every day and every month, and I calculated I probably have read the Proverbs uh, well over 500 times since I was a freshman in college many, many, many years ago. Now, had I not read the Proverbs, I wouldn't be as wise as I am today. <laughs> and I say that sarcastically. And <laughs> I can't imagine uh, what my life would be like if I didn't read the Proverbs at all. Um, but there was, uh, I, I started doing this. Let me see if we get this right. Oh, we got it. Uh, when I was a freshman in college, I did a study on Martin Luther. He was the reformer. And Martin Luther did a number of different things in, for his spiritual, de for his devotions. He read five chapters from the Gospels in that particular day. He read five chapters from the Psalms, and then he read a chapter from the book of Proverbs. And of course, Martin Luther was the guy that uh, led the Reformation to break away from the Catholic Church and protested and 
Hence, we have the Protestant movement, and that's what, what took place with him. Uh, there's a, a gentleman that looks familiar to you there, uh, Dr. Ben Carson, wonderful Christian man. And Ben Carson, when he was a young man, had a terrible temper by his own testimony. And he says, when I was, I was, an, uh, I was an A student at that time, but I realized that at that moment, that with a temper like that, my options were three, reform school. I, I was thinking about you, John, when, he was, when I was reading this about him. <laughs> Ref Ref <laughs> reform school, jail, or the grave. And Cheryl said, amen. None of the options appealed to me, so I just locked myself up in the bathroom, and I started praying, and I says, Lord, I can't deal with this temper. Sometimes we got to get to that place with whatever we're dealing with that we have to come. Uh, Cheryl had mentioned the, the 12 steps. A big part of the 12 steps is everyone has to come to their end. They have to bottom out. And for us, many times, we have to come to a place where we just, we've tried everything else, and we have to cry out to God. And that's what uh, Ben Carson did. Lord, I can't deal with this temper. And I picked up my Bible and started reading from the book of Proverbs. That was the first day that I started doing it. And I've been doing it every day since then because it had all these verses in it about anger. And it seemed like they were all applicable to me. So I imagine uh, Ben Carson still does that uh, even today. Uh, a gentleman by the name of George Washington that we're familiar with, he was the father of our nation, at a very young age, I did the research, I was introduced to the Proverbs. And as a matter of fact, a lot of his writings uh, were indicative and characteristic of the Proverbs that he read. And so George Washington, and this is a, a, a scene that is depicted in Valley Forge where they, he was a very, I don't want to say a religious man because that has bad connotations. He was a very godly man. He was a very spiritual man. The, the, the revisionists, the history revisionists had made him to be a deist. He wasn't a deist. He was a born-again believer. If you read his writings, you would see. And a big part of his influence in his life was the book of Proverbs. Now, George Washington was a man that loved his soldiers. He led the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. He was an incredible, if you do any reading about him, he, was, he, just, he loved his men and his men loved him. And a part of his interaction with his guys, his soldiers, was because he was a student of the book of Proverbs. When he later became uh, the first commander in chief, the president of the United States, it was the Proverbs and the scriptures that dictated and governed the way that he governed uh, our country. And so a big part, unfortunately, uh, the historians have covered all that up and uh, they've made our, uh, if, if you do any kind of studying at all, you'll find out that the Bible played a very big part in the early history of the United States and the book of Proverbs. Now what I want to do is I want to show you some introduc introductions to the book of Proverbs via different study Bibles. The first one, and this will help us to get an understanding, it's from the Life Application Study Bible. Now let me say something about study Bibles. Study Bibles are good to a degree. A lot of times study Bibles are written based on the authors or the, the, the series of authors, their theological perspective. Uh, if you read Ryrie's study uh, Bible, you will get a, um, a very different perspective than what you want to hear. If you read another study Bible, so a lot of times the study Bible, they're good. They help you to understand. They look at the cultural, the historical, uh, even the language differences and so on, but understand that that they are different than they reflect that particular uh, writer right there. They couldn't do too much to Proverbs because it's a very simple kind of a book. But it says the purpose is to teach people how to attain wisdom and discipline and a prudent life and how to do what is right j and just and fair. In short, to, divine, to apply divine wisdom to daily life and to provide moral instruction. Knowledge is good, but there is a vast difference between knowledge, having the facts, and wisdom, applying those facts to life. We may amass knowledge, but without wisdom, our knowledge is useless. useless. We must learn how to live out what we know. And then from the New Open Bible uh, study right there, it says the key to Proverbs is wisdom, the ability to live life skillfully, a godly life in an ungodly world. However, there's no simple assignment. Proverbs provides detailed instructions for his people to deal successfully 
with the practical affairs of everyday life. Uh, Max Lucado is a great, great writer said in his inspirational Bible, Proverbs is a collection of lamps, not spotlights that blind, not bonfires that blaze, but lamps. Lamps that do for your heart what lamps in your house do for your eyes. They chase away the darkness. Reading Proverbs turns on the lamps in the dark corners of life, corners such as foolishness, pride, lack of humility, fear, insecurity, wealth, lack of mercy, uh, lack of uh, lust, lack of diligence, laziness, lack of prudence, anger, flattery, gossip, violence, and that's, as Max says, it goes on and on and on. Just because, before I go, go to the next slide there, just because you and I are born-again believers and spirit-filled doesn't take away from the fact that we still have a nature and a part of us that needs to be dealt with. Um, I was a young man in a Pentecostal church and I was elected to the board at a very young age. I was in college at the time and I remember my first board meeting that I went to, I saw, John, I saw and heard things from these, these spiritual, godly Pentecostal men that I could not believe was taking place. And so the, 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 the Spirit of God is working inside of us because if someone said, God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. And so we've got things inside of us that need to be changed. And what we're talking about, and as Robert Heidler was teaching this morning, David had to get through some things in order to fulfill the destiny that God had called him to. And I think that you and I, at least I'll speak for myself, there's things inside of me that still need to be taken care of and maybe need to be addressed or eliminated in order for me to fully walk into the destiny that he has for me. Now, I can be like a, a guy that I met one time. He says, I've got a bad temper. My dad had a bad temper. His grandpa had a bad temper. And I will have a bad temper the rest of my life. Now, we believe in deliverance. And God can take care of bad tempers. But there's still things inside of us, mannerisms, behaviors, some of these things that we see up here. Uh, simple things like laziness. Uh, Proverbs says, as a door turns on, on its hinges, so a lazy man turns on his bed. There's different things that, that even though we're spiritual and even though we're, we're, we're tongue talkers or whatever, there's things inside of us that need to be addressed and need to be taken care of. And my hope tonight, if that if you're not a student of the Proverbs, is that I will whet your appetite so that you will see that this is a part of uh, your daily spiritual input that you need to be, that you need to have a part of you. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, Proverbs accomplishes something no other biblical book does. It, sim it simply compiles numerous short instructions for living in a, an effective life on earth. While other books articulate profound theological truths, lengthy narratives of triumphs and, and failure, or prophetic preaching to a disobedient people, Proverbs concerns itself completely with instructing people in the path of wisdom. The primary author of Proverbs, anybody know who the primary author is? King Solomon. Now there's others, a couple other characters that, that are in there, but King Solomon is the one that pretty, pretty much wrote uh, the book of Proverbs. Uh, he reigned in Israel from 1791 to 931 BC. So his writings, you can see, are very old. They're very old. They're ancient writings. But I want to let you know that they're very relevant for us today. As a matter of fact, all the scriptures are like that. They're written a thousand years ago, 2,000 2, years ago or more. But they're very relevant for us today because it's not just a physical book. It is a spiritual book. It's quick and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it, it's, it's alive, the, the, the scriptures. And the Proverbs are part of that. This is where Solomon got his wisdom. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask, what shall I give you? Imagine God appears to you and says, Rich, do I know, what do you want? Here. It's good, Rich. 
And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant, your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth and righteousness and in, upright, and in an upright, uprightness of heart with you. I'm getting a glare from this thing. Let me go like this. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is to this day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I am a little child. Now he wasn't a little child; he was just he was he was young in his thinking. He wasn't he didn't feel he was fully developed in his thinking or mature. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked for this thing and have not asked uh, long life for yourself, nor have asked, for, asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but, I, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you bef before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. So the wisdom that Solomon got did not come from his dad, did not come from teachers. It came from God himself. Now know that what God gave to Solomon, Solomon is passing down to us via the book of Proverbs. And so if you are a stunad or a stunades, that's a girl stunad, and you're lacking in some character qualities, uh, the way you think, the way that you act, that your temperament, whatever, there is hope for us. If you're a bozo, or what's a female equivalent, equivalent of a bozo? A bozoette. And you've got some things about you that need to be changed. There is hope for us. There is hope for us. You can be a believer for so many years and still walk in a particular way that needs to be changed. And, and uh, just, there's some things that need to t take place in your life. The purpose of the book of Proverbs, I'm going to take you through the first seven verses of this particular book. If you have your Bibles, you can look along. Um, if you're taking notes, I see people taking notes. If you don't want to take notes, sigcanalis at comcast.net, and I'll send them to you. No charge tonight. Tomorrow it'll cost you, but sigcanalis at comcast.net, and I'll send it to you. And by the way, what we're doing, did we hit the record button? Oh, you guys are good. Uh, what we started doing last week, we started recording the services, the messages, and uh, there's a clipboard over there. A sign up if you would like tonight or any night. If you'd like a copy of the message on a CD, uh, you can just put your name over there, and the next week we'll deliver those to you. Okay, so the purpose of the book of Proverbs. Also on YouTube. Thanks. Do you want to tell us about that? No? Okay. <laughs> the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Let's take that. I highlighted that word Proverbs up there. A proverb is a Pithy, it sounds like a sad kind of a word. Pithy simply means concise. A pithy maxim, as a lot of the definitions gives us. A maxim is uh, simply a short statement expressing truth or a rule of conduct. So the prover a proverb is a short, concise sentence that conveys truth or the way that we should act. The book of Proverbs is a collection of short wise sayings and then it says to know wisdom with this particular word wisdom occurs 41 times throughout the book of proverbs wisdom is the primary theme of the book of proverbs oh incidentally uh, king solomon uh, because he was given this wisdom actually gave to us three different books of wisdom he gave to us the book of proverbs he gave to us ecclesiastes and song of solomon he wrote, uh, produced at least 3,000 proverbs, 1,005 different songs that God 
had given to him. We see that recorded in 1 Kings chapter 4. Uh, but wisdom is to know how to skillfully to apply knowledge and facts to everyday life and living. Wisdom is not man's wisdom, it's godly wisdom. Now there is a gift of wisdom. That, we're not talking about the gift of wisdom. John referred to the spiritual gifts and the gift of wisdom is one of them. This is a wisdom that we can derive from the book of Proverbs. This is a wisdom that can literally change the way that we act, the way that we think, the way that we speak, the way that we inter interact with people. Uh, if you've got some things that have been passed down and, and still deliverance hasn't taken those things out, uh, maybe you need to go back for some more deliverance. Uh, but, but there is a strain inside of us. Uh, th there is a, how can I say it? Uh, there is a, uh, a carnal side of us that where these different characteristics will come up and that have to be dealt with. And if you don't see them, then you will continue to act like that. But if you have the opportunity to see them and to see these things pointed out, then you can, the Holy Spirit can say, Bob, do you know that you are this way? Bob's a good man, so I, I can pick on Bob without even feeling like I'm saying anything. <laughs> Bob, do you know this way? I could say that to Bob, and Bob would say, who are you to tell me where I am? <laughs> Carol's been trying to tell me for all these years. <laughs> Stu hasn't changed. But if Bob should read something inside of the book of Proverbs that puts its finger on that particular characteristic, the Holy Spirit can say, <clears throat> Bob, oh, that's you, Lord. I know you, I recognize your voice. Bob, look at this particular proverb in 1521. Oh, yeah. I, I know I have that problem. You see, the Holy Spirit can change things inside of us. Um, no, we, we won't even go there. Let's, I was going to say something about husband and wives, but we'll, we'll, we'll bypass. Don't do it, Dave. Don't do it. <laughs> instruction. Not only is it good for wisdom, but instruction. Instruction is, uh, other words are reproof, correction, discipline, and chastisement. Um, there's times when we need to be corrected. And sometimes we won't listen to the correction that comes from another person. But the word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so it can change us. To perceive words of understanding or the ability to discern. Now, that's been an issue that I've had for many years, not been able to discern this or that. The Proverbs, again, as I said, if I didn't read the Proverbs over 500 times, I'm, I would have been in real bad shape by this time right now. So there's still hope. <laughs> Being able to separate this side or that side. Solomon said in chapter 4, verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Verses 3 and 4, to perceive instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. This word prudence simply means good judgment, to give good judgment. Some of us don't have good judgment in spending. Some of us don't have good judgment in picking friends. Some of us don't have good judgment in relationships or whatever. It could be a host of different things. But the Proverbs, the, the teachings of the Proverbs and the wisdom that we derive can help us to be a prudent person. Discretion, the quality of, and here's a tough one. The quality of discretion is the, the, the quality of behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid to cause unnecessary offenses. Boy, that is lacking so much. Well, I'm telling the truth, Jack. The Bible says tell the truth. 
but it says to tell the truth what? In, in love. And discretion and being discreet in our actions and our dealings with people will get a whole lot further than if we just blurt out the truth and just bowl somebody over with the truth. Well, the book of Proverbs and the teaching of Proverbs nails that down and teaches us that we don't have to be this way, that we can change. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb, proverb and an enigma. Enigma is like something that's hard to understand, like a, a mystery or a riddle. And then here's the key. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, there's different aspects of fear that we understand. Uh, the first fear, of course, is to be afraid uh, of God um, because he's an all-powerful God. Ananias and Sapphira were not afraid of God, and we know that in the book of Acts. You see what happened, happened to them. But there's a side of God that we don't hear a whole lot about that they used to preach many, many years ago when they would preach about hell. And hell is a very real place. And preachers today don't preach about hell because it's just not politically correct. It's not acceptable. It doesn't make people feel good. But there is a side of God. Jesus said, I just read it. He says, don't fear him who can take your life, but fear him who can take your life and your soul. The Bible says that it is a dangerous thing and a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. There's a side of God that we don't hear a whole lot about today um, that is just as real as he's gracious and he's loving and he's forgiving. So that's part of the fear of the Lord. And you know what? There's a lot within the body of Christ, within the church itself. There's a lot of stuff that goes on because the fear of the Lord is lacking. We've got a lot of sloppy agape that's been going around and not a whole lot of the fear of the Lord. The other side of the fear of the Lord that we need is, uh, and this is one that we hear a lot about, is there's a reverence about God. There's a respect. There's an honor of God because of who he is. He's an, he's, he's an awesome, awesome God. And, and I remember years ago when I was a young man and I was learning to walk with the Lord, I came to the place where I said, Lord, because I love you so much and I honor you so much, I don't want to offend you. Remember Joseph when Mrs. Potiphar with those flashing eyes was trying to, trying to seduce him? And do you remember what Joseph said to her? He says, how can I do this great sin and sin against God? He had a fear of God that kept him from crossing the line. A lot, of, a lot of the church today does not have that healthy fear. You know, and, and we see this displayed in so many different ways. But God is saying to us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of this knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Compare this to, look at this New Testament writing. Paul wrote to the church of Colossae. For this reason we also since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled, and I put into bold, filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, there's a continuity from the Old Testament into the New Testament about knowledge and wisdom and understanding. The teachings of the wisdom that's derived from the book of Proverbs will have a direct effect and influence on our relationships. Ginger and I have been married for how many years now, Ginger? We're going on 44. Whew. It just seems like 12 years, Ginger. <laughs> Is that right, John? Did I just get there? Don't get me in. <laughs> I want to tell you that I began reading the Proverbs before Ginger and I got married. I was a freshman in college. We got married when I was a sophomore, between my sophomore and junior year, I believe. 
And the book of Proverbs has literally had an effect on the way that I interact and I relate to Ginger. The book of Proverbs has had a direct effect on how I relate to my sons and act with my sons. The teachings of the book of Proverbs can affect, in a positive way, relations, whether it's with your family, your immediate family, your distant family, uh, your relatives, your outlaws, in-laws, all those people, people at work, your neighbors, co-workers, uh, even right here in our church, in this body right here. The book of Proverbs and the teaching and the understanding of how to interact and how to respond to one another can have an effect. The book of Proverbs can affect our finances, of how we view our finances and how we how we handle our finances, business dealings, uh, our morality and ethics, our thought life, the book of Proverbs, can have an effect. Our words, our actions, our attitudes, on and on. Even our health, the book of Proverbs talks about health issues. How to use the Proverbs. Read it, and I want to propose to you uh, today is the 22nd of March, and this morning I read chapter 22. Tomorrow's the 23rd, so I'll read chapter 23 tomorrow. I want to suggest to you that if you're not reading the Bible in, in any disciplined way, the book of Proverbs is a good way to start. And so begin to read it uh, daily. Memorize it. Memorize some of the things that were... Uh, where God has hit a nerve and, and, and you know this is an area that needs to be changed in your life, begin to memorize that thing and then meditate on that. When, when you go to sleep at night, when you're driving in your car, meditate on that. Uh, pray it. Uh, what I do is uh, I have my iPhone, and it's probably not a wise thing, but this is what I do. I put my iPhone about this right here, in front of me when I'm driving, and I put the particular proverb up there, and I put it in real bold print so that I'm not like squinting, and I literally will be driving, I'm looking, and I'm scrolling, I'm reading different proverbs, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning, I'm still, God's still working on me. I was just kidding. I really don't do that. <laughs> Fool you. <laughs> but that's how I'm on the road a lot. And so that's how I actually will pray the Proverbs a lot of times is I will take a particular. <laughs> Carol's given me a very bad look, Bob. I can imagine you've gotten that look before. <laughs> but uh, that's one way that I pray it. And then, of course, to apply the Proverbs. Be a do-do reader of the scriptures. James says, do not be what? Hearers only, but what? Doer. A doer. And it's interesting, James is considered the Proverbs of the New Testament. So as I read the Proverbs, and one particular proverb sticks out to me and hits a nerve, and I, I realize that this is not for Ginge, it's for me, that I need to apply it to my life. Now, it's not by human effort that I change and by you and I change. It's by, not by, my, not by power nor by might, but by what? By the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that begins to make changes inside of us. John referred to the gifts of the Spirit. There's also the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 2. And so we've got the Holy Spirit can change us we can be, uh, Bob and I, when we first do, started doing this thing back there, uh, when Woody left us, and I said, I said, Bob, you and I are old dogs. We're learning new tricks. You can, as an old dog, you can change. You don't have to be the same. Your wife, your husband, your mom and dad, people at work don't have to have the same cantankerous whatever at work. You can change as the Holy Spirit convicts but empowers you to make those changes. 
And I just want to give a few, uh, a number of different personal uh, proverbs that have meant something to me. And um, I, I, I want to share these with you. This one right here, probably, this is probably one of everyone's favorite. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, this is a great refrigerator verse. This looks good up on the refrigerator. But it's better if we actually live that particular verse. So I will pray this. I says, Lord, help me to trust you with all of my heart. I've got a certain situation that I'm dealing with. Help me, God, to, to change and not to lean on my own understanding. But, Lord, help me in this particular situation, as it says right here, to acknowledge you. Because you, God, are the one that ultimately can change the situation. And maybe it's in a personal matter. Only you can change me. Maybe it's you're trying to seek direction. As I acknowledge you, direct my path. You guys, that is an incredible truth right there. That'll take away ajita, that'll allow you to sleep late in the morning when you can't go to sleep because you're, you got the cold sweats because you've, you've got, you're worried or whatever. I don't know if that's ever happened to anyone at all. Where you just, just start breaking out of sweat because you're trying to think of something, how to cure something or how to take care of something. Take time to acknowledge him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledge him. And the Bible says, the proverb says here, that he will direct our path. Was it? That's right. And, and also about our thinking. With our thinking. I, 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 look at that. And he will put us back on track. He will put us on there. So you see, we can be, and I don't know if you're like, I was going to say me, but me, I won't use me. We can be so bullheaded. <laughs> she went to your chin. She just thought that was funny. <laughs> we, can, we can be so bullheaded about something that we've made it a matter of prayer. And you know, that's the nice thing, we make it a matter of prayer. But God wants to change. He wants to change and redirect. But we first have to acknowledge him. Cheryl referred to those steps. The, the, the third step, I pastored a whole church of uh, recovering addicts. The first step is to acknowledge that I'm powerless over this addiction. The second step says that I came to believe in a power that's greater than myself. The third step talks about I surrendered my will over to the care of God. And so that's the part that we need to get to. Just to know about something isn't going to change it. We have to turn it over to him. Remember we used to sing a song a long time ago? Turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus. Tick, tick. Turn it over to Jesus. Anybody know the rest? And you can smile the rest of <laughs> Okay. Can't say can't. Anyway. Right there. We'll get you up there. Why we've gotten off the right path is because we didn't acknowledge him. Yes. You know, so it's so simple when you think about it. These are, bi these are, these are this is being said in big biblical words, but down the, where the rubber meets the road, why we get messed up is because we haven't given God a call in our life. And so that's how we make it real. We give him a thought. We begin to think about him, and we begin to say, God, put me, where, put me back on yeah. track. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. Yeah. We interrupted you. 
But Cheryl, also, and you've said this before too, is that a lot of times what we pray is what we want, not necessarily what God wants. Uh, what did Isaiah say? He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Actually, God said that through Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are, my thoughts are so much higher. No, I didn't see it. Come on, come back. Who am I? Who am I to say no? <laughs> well, here I, I I'm going to pass this around because this is this is key because you didn't watch Shabbat. Right. Okay, but I got to find. I'm looking for a picture. Uh, I want to pass it around. Somebody can take a napkin and wrench. We were driving to North Jersey Friday to pray at places, and we were in the car. Now, I looked up in the sky, and in the cloud was a wrench, a, cl a wrench cloud, a wrench. That was Friday, but Wednesday prior at the prayer meeting, Richard had a vision of a wrench, and you know, we prayed about the wrench, and John said what he thought the wrench meant. You know, a wrench can tighten things. It can loosen things. You can throw it in something, and it'll stop it from moving. You know, you know, like you throw a wrench in something, that's what that means. Yeah. So uh, we were on, this way, on our way to pray at this place, and I looked up, and I took the picture, and the Lord spoke to me in my car, and he said, I'm getting ready to throw a wrench in the, in the plan of the enemy in your life and in your lives, okay? So now, I'm so glad I took a picture of it. So I sent it to Chuck, and Chuck showed the picture Friday night on, on the World Wide Web, on the Shabbat, and he read that scripture. He said, heaven, the heavens are higher than the earth, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And he said, God's getting ready to throw a wrench in the familiarity of the way we have always thought God would work. And I want to tell you something, because this goes along with this, Sig. We, we get in our mind, being in a church, that God's always going to work in the same old way. Yeah. He doesn't do that. He can come on somebody that you would never expect him to come on and can use that person. He can use situations in our lives. The, the situation might be crappy, but God will use that situation mm. to cause us to acknowledge him because we've never acknowledged him before. And so I, I just want to, th this scripture coming out that, his ways are not our yeah. ways, and his thoughts are higher than us. We need to get off the throne <laughs> of our life and put God on it. And we do it by thinking about him yeah. in our life. Try to do it on a daily basis. Just say, okay, God, here I am. I'm walking to the post office or whatever you're doing, changing a tire, changing the oil, whatever. Stop for a moment and say, hey, God, I know you're here. What do you want to say to me today? Yeah. And he just might put a cloud in the sky that will shift what you were going to do that day and change your life, change the life of a nation. So that was it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thank you, thank you, thank you. You know what? is that if you read the Proverbs on a monthly basis, this principle and this truth, you will be reminded of it at least once a month instead of when you read it 20 years ago and you thought it was a cute verse. And if you read this and the Spirit of God quickens you and you say, Lord, I need to acknowledge you. I need to acknowledge you because I don't know what else to do right now. 
so I'm going to acknowledge you. Let me move past a couple of these here. Um, this is a particular verse that um, I had read many, many years ago. And I, I share this with guys. That's good. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Now, God is saying a couple different things here. And the, the inference here is that you found a good wife. What that means is you found a good wife. Richard means that God's favor is upon you. Gordon, it means that God's favor has been upon you because you got a good wife. It had nothing to do with you <laughs> or me, but it has to do with the favor of God. And if I can just even stretch it a little bit further, if I can infer, maybe the wife that God or the husband that God gave to you was to help to change some things about, I, I see Troy, he's nodding his head. <laughs> Amen. Maybe there's some things that God wants to change inside of us. And, you know, God is a great matchmaker. He's a great matchmaker. And there's things I'm praying for Ginger that she hasn't changed yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Ginger, I'm sorry. I take those words back. No, I'm, I'm the one that God has used uh, or Ginger has used to change. Uh, look at this one here. Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Father, I thank you that for the wife that you've blessed, with, blessed me with almost 44 years. I thank you, Lord, for the woman that she is. I even called her a Proverbs 31 woman this morning. I thank you for the, the wives that are in this congregation uh, that you've blessed us with. I thank you, God, because uh, you make no mistakes and you are interested in changing us and taking some things inside, out, outside of us. And in these situations here, you use our spouse to help do that. Almost finished. Let me just, I want to touch on this one here. I've got three verses that deal with this one here. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a broken, a city broken down without walls. Yes, to anyone, a wall around a city is to keep the enemy out. But if I don't have control over my temperament, I can look as sweet as pie, but have a nasty mean streak inside of me. If I don't have control of that, it says that it's like a city without the walls. The enemy can come in. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. There's a passage in James it says be slow be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry for the wrath of man does not produce well, she's got that down pretty good huh? <laughs> is that for you or for rich no, for oh it's for you okay <laughs> you see now if if I read this if I keep a regular schedule, monthly schedule, well, on the 14th day, if I'm still this do not right here, I'm either going to pass over it and just ignore it, or I'm going to say once again, the Holy Spirit's going to say, say, you got a real issue right here. You need to surrender it. You need to acknowledge him. And the last, well, I've got one more after this. Just the, the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Now, let me just say something about this right here, guys, on the, to overlook a transgression. Every day you and I are transgressed against, if I can use that word right there. People cut in front of us on the road. Ooh, they think they are. We beep the horn. We, I won't say some other things that we might do. Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. 
But there's probably more times that we need to overlook a transgression as opposed to addressing it. Yeah. Everything that's done against us doesn't need to be addressed. Yeah. If it does, then you've got a real problem. There's some things that a, a, a teacher used to say, just let it roll off like water off a duck's back. Don't let it stick. You think about it, oh, I wish I should have said this. I can't believe they said that to me. Oh, I just, and you go to bed, you're thinking, oh, oh next time I wish I uh, Just let it go, Jack. Just let it go. Last one here. Whew. 15 verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. It reminds me, I was teaching... Uh, Years ago, when I was a youth director, Ginger and I, um, we were with a bunch of kids in, um, in Bristol, PA, and I had been teaching on, not the book of Proverbs, but on anger. And I was teaching them about this right here, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In other words, someone gets in your face, and automatically what we want to do, we want to get back in their face. Who do you think you are to talk to me like that? <laughs> you just don't understand, do you? And so we get back in their face. The Proverbs is saying something totally different. It's saying, but harsh words, or excuse me, soft answer turns away, but harsh words stirs up anger. You get back in someone's face, guess what? They're going to get back in your face, and it keeps going, going, and going, and going. So I was teaching to the kids. Youth group was over. Youth meeting was over. Uh, we were taking kids home in the church van. It was winter time. I can remember the very spot. It was at a 7-Eleven in Ben Salem on Street Road. The van, I had a bunch of teenagers. They were loud, sweating. The, the windows were all fogged up. I had to run into 7-Eleven to get something. I don't know what it was. And I got back in, and all the kids were just being kids. And I couldn't see. Well, I backed up. And as I was backing up, <coughs> I hit a car right behind me. Because I couldn't see because my windows were all fogged up automatically the guy gets out of his car. He's like phew, spitting and cussing, and, and it's real loud, and the kids got all quiet <laughs> because Sig was going to get in a fight <laughs> with this guy. And it wasn't my fault. It was the fog's fault. But I got out, and the guy was, I mean, it could have been Fifth City right then and there on ben Sa in Street Road in Ben Salem. And I got out, and I wasn't even thinking about this right here, but automatically I said, I'm sorry, it's my fault, sir. I said, I've got a van load of kids, the windows were fogged, and I should have been more careful. And he went from a raving lunatic to a quiet mouse. He says, oh, that's all right. It's just an old bomb. It doesn't matter. And that was it. Judy Kay? So, oh, Ben <laughs> That's prophetic. But guys, these different proverbs that we read can literally change the way that we act. Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham. This is my last slide. I read five psalms every day, and that teaches me how to get along with God. Then I read a chapter of Proverbs every day, and that teaches me how to get along with my fellow man. Isn't that good? As I said this morning, Robert Heiler was teaching on David and how David had to find uh, through his flaws and failures, and he had them. He wasn't perfect. But he, had, he was on course to fulfill his destiny, just like every one of us has a God-given destiny. Some of us are walking in it now. Some of us are just beginning to walk in it. Some of us are not quite there yet for God to say, this is what I want you to do. Proverbs of King Solomon, David's son, interesting, helps us to overcome those human flaws and failures so that we can live our lives in such a way that we can fulfill our God-given destinies. The combination of the Holy Spirit within us and the knowledge and the wisdom from the book of Proverbs will help to propel us into what God wants us to be and what God desires to do through you and I. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. 
for this ancient book that you gave to us thousands of years ago. And though they're thousands of years old, they have tre tremendous relevancy to us today. God, you love us just the way we were when you saved us, but you loved us too much to allow us to stay that same way. And you sent your Holy Spirit to change us, to, become, to help us to become more like Jesus, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Well, there's some things inside of us, God, that need to be changed. And one of the change agents that you've given to us is this precious book, this ancient book, a book of wisdom, a book of understanding and knowledge. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here in this sanctuary here and those that might be listening across the web, that, Lord, you would put a love and a desire in our heart to open up to the middle of our Bibles and begin to read the Proverbs. And Holy Spirit, you inspire the writings of the Proverbs to King Solomon. Speak to us and change us according to what you designed and what you purposed in those words. And I pray this in the awesome and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's just take a minute. Bow your heads. Father, with this message, I felt a little conviction of the Holy Spirit going out. If you felt conviction by this message, then you need to rededicate yourself tonight. Just say, Lord Jesus, I give you my heart afresh. Work anew in me. Bring me to that place where I acknowledge you in all your ways. Direct my path. Put me back on the path that you have for the destiny of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we bless the offering. Lord, we ask you to multiply it. Bless the seed sown in Jesus' name. God bless you on the web. We'll see you Wednesday night on the Zoom. <laughs>